Hit it. Welcome to the Test Talks Podcast, the place to go to geek out on software testing. And now your host, whose mission is to help you succeed with test automation, Joe Colantonio. Hey, welcome to another episode of Test Talks, a podcast dedicated to all things test automation related. I'm your host, Joe from JoeColantonio.com. And if you're like me, one of the biggest problems with learning Selenium is all the various information you need to piece together in order to get started. It's really easy to get frustrated and filled up with information overload. And at the end, making no progress with learning Selenium. So I used to always wish that there was a quick jumpstart guide that could get me started with test automation without all the bells and whistles. Then I discovered the Selenium Guidebook by Dave Hefner. It's a concise, good practice approach to learning Selenium quickly. There's also different packages you can purchase to accelerate your learning process even quicker with tip sheets and videos and, of course, the guidebook itself. The Selenium Guidebook Ruby edition has been around for a few years, but hot off the presses, Dave has just released the Selenium Guidebook Java edition. So if you really want to learn Selenium in 2016 or pick up a new tip or trick, you definitely need to check out the Selenium Guidebook and this episode. So check it out. Test Talks is sponsored by the fantastic folks at Sauce Labs, the cloud-based automated testing platform that eliminates the need to maintain your own Selenium grid and test infrastructure. Try it for free today. Visit testtalks.com and click on the Sign Up Now link under the Homepage Sponsor section. Hey, Dave. Welcome back to Test Talks. Hey, thanks for having me. It's great to finally have you back on the show. You were in Episode 2, uh, so it's been quite a while. So what have you been up to since last time we spoke? Oh, man. Um, a lot of stuff. I, I've, uh, I've been to a lot of countries talking about Selenium uh, and consulting with companies to kind of see what they've been doing with Selenium. And it's really been kind of a fascinating uh, set of experiences the mainly the the company visits um I spent some time in uh in Israel and got to to meet with a bunch of companies and and see companies at different levels of maturity and see some ones with with just really fascinating implementation of of selenium really robust really mature really dialed in and so, some very non obvious uses of selenium like I saw one company that was using it for doing um monitoring for their website. Just some really interesting uses, use cases, but uh, and I've also uh, so I released a second edition of my book. Nice. Uh, so, so I branched out from uh, Ruby into Java, and that was, it was something I was doing. Uh, I started before I started traveling overseas to for Selenium stuff, but I it was kind of really confirmed and driven home how how widespread Java is with regards to Selenium. Uh, every company, with with like one exception, used Java for selenium and and then i since then i've looked up all the download numbers for selenium across all the programming languages and java owns this year something like 65 percent of the downloads for selenium wow yeah i agree with that it seems that everyone seems to be using java and it's just a lot easier when you're googling issues uh because most people are using java to find ways to fix whatever you, you may be encountering so i find that helpful in that case but I also like your point of view that you have also where if you're developers, you don't necessarily need to use the same exact language as your developers. Do you still believe that? Or uh, what are your thoughts now that you know that Java is one of the, the main language bindings that most people use? I, I still think that my my stance from when, when I spoke last time and what I've written about, it still holds true that the who who's owning it is what matters. Um, and I, I've also seen an explosive growth in JavaScript usage. Mm. Um, so companies with uh, mature implemented Java frameworks uh, leaning into the thought of rewriting things into JavaScript. Uh, and that's because the front-end developers are showing a real interest now that Node.js ha- um, you know, came on the scene and, and that's gaining a lot of popularity. Uh, and there's a bunch of different web driver um, libraries in Node that people are really excited about. And so... I, I met with a bunch of companies that have also expressed interest in that, and that's showing that you know it, it was a different perspective than what I had thought. I mean, originally it was people who aren't programmers trying to learn to program, and then that's where that original argument came from. 
And now seeing the people who are owning it are people who are building the front ends and then they're excited about testing. And of course you would want to encourage and nurture that. Right. So, uh, so that's been really interesting because I think that um, this year alone, the JavaScript downloads for Selenium uh, have, uh, yeah, I think they eclipsed all prior years combined. Wow. <laughs> so it's, and that's making, I think that's the number two, JavaScript's number two in terms of the downloads this year. Wow. So would you think that the reason for that is this year? Is it because of Protractor or, or the adoption of AngularJS? I've been hearing more and more about JavaScript. I, I, I know it's very popular, but I, I can't stand writing uh, writing in, in JavaScript. But uh, yeah, what, what are your thoughts around that? Uh, I honestly, I don't know the breakdown across all libraries, but I, I do think that, um, I, I think that there is just more and more JavaScript, uh, you know, all the time now, yep. uh, and, you know, more so every year. And then, um, the fact that there are people who have turned their eye towards WebDriver, uh, and made some libraries that are approachable, um, probably helps. And then the fact that, yeah, there's Angular, there's Protractor, there's things like that, that, that probably all helps. And if that's backended by the same library that's, that you could just write straight Selenium tests with, uh, instead of having this nice layer on top of it, that works too. Uh, I, I would assume it's that, um, or it's just like j the JavaScript community, the front end community is just catching up and saying, "Hey, this is actually really cool." Right. So maybe, so it could just be that you know they got a taste for it, and now and now it's just getting you know passed around as like a cultural ex expected thing. Just like how within Ruby, testing is is a part of the culture. Now it's like with JavaScript, you know, we're using Node. It's like well, using Selenium is easy and it should be done. And it's cool. So yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I guess I work for a large company, and our front end developers they use JavaScript, they use AngularJS. So they wanted to write the framework in Java, but most of the other developers uh, write in Java, not JavaScript. So I didn't know, do I have two frameworks, one in JavaScript, one in Java? Uh, so it's always, it's always a, you know, a fine line between, do I just let them create whatever they're going to create because we're going to get better testing? Or do we just say, uh, let's all go around one tool, one framework, and that's what we're going to use? Yeah, I think that that's a real tough, uh, a tough thing to figure out. And I've seen a couple companies navigate that. And I don't think that they figured out a good answer yet. And, uh, you know, I think, I think I've seen, there was a talk at, um, Selenium Conf, uh, in Portland earlier this year. Uh, I think it was about having kind of a, a testing as a service, almost like a rest endpoint that could receive a uh, wire protocol from WebDriver and execute tests on a, on a infrastructure of, of, uh, grid nodes and, and how it didn't really matter what, uh, what language you wrote it in, and it would just receive it. And, and they 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 did some clever stuff, but um, it was it was interesting to think like, oh, well, what if you did have multiple languages, but one you know kind of one way to execute them all, and then as long as you can kind of aggregate the results in the reports. Um, and the hard part I think is just making sure that the feature set across languages is consistent, because that's always the big issue with a rewrite is that you know you end up with things that are doing things differently yep. and if you have someone move from one team to another like that's just not something that's conducive for for growth ultimately awesome so as it seems like you, know, you mostly were working in ruby and it sounds like you've uh, just started implementing java i, I i'm pretty sure you're going to implement every language binding for your selenium guidebook so have you learned anything specifically about java though as you were working on java that you didn't know about I don't know if there's anything specific about Java other than uh, I guess I had this, um, uh, you know, since I came to test automation, n not as a programmer, like I really had very limited programming background that uh, and I spent so much time in Ruby that I was kind of, I guess, innately af afraid of Java and like compiled languages because it seemed like extra, you know, uh, very verbose and had all these other requirements. It, you know, you have to deal with compilers and you need a, you really need an IDE to use it well. And, and then after I got into it, it was like, oh, this is actually pretty straightforward, uh, especially with an IDE because it just does so much of the hard part for you. The thing I would say is that uh, it was actually a nice uh, a nice break from spending so much time in a dynamically typed scripting language where everything is an object to a very explicit, strongly typed language that's compiled, a scripting language where everything is an object to a very explicit, strongly typed language that's compiled what it's doing. Whereas in Ruby, if you you know, if inadvertently somehow the, the type of an object gets changed, that object becomes that new type. And, but there's no way to really know. And so you could have a, a really pernicious bug in your, in your test code and not realize it and finding it could be hard. But in, but in Java, it's like, well, it just won't run. It's like, and it will tell you where it's broken. <laughs> so, uh, and it'll probably tell you where it's broken as you type. 
and so I, I just really appreciated that. It, I think it made uh, it made things a fair bit easier, and that you know you can work past the the verbosity of things pretty quickly because you you end up gaining a lot of insight into exactly what a test is, is supposed to be doing. Awesome. Yeah, you actually have a pretty good video on YouTube where I forget where what conference it is. I think it was in Russia, where you talk about building a a, a, a maintainable, reliable framework in Selenium using Java, and it was really I thought it was really good. So I'll include that in the show notes, but. So I guess my question was, one of the things that came out of that was you mentioned something about JUnit rules. What's a JUnit rule? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm refreshing my memory because uh, when I just, I, I released updated editions of my book and I, I started with Java, then ended with Ruby. So oh. <laughs> I've got, I got Ruby on the brain. Let me give myself a refresher. Uh, so there's two things that I use that I think are lesser known or, or just not, you know, enjoyed uh, for use. And, and so there's the JUnit rules and then there were um, categories. And so JUnit rules are what I used. Uh, they're, they're basically built-in um, functionality that exists within JUnit that enables you to do extra things like storing the setup and teardown actions in, in different places. And so when I end up creating this framework uh, that I talk about in my book, and then I, I t- I've talked about it at various talks and at workshops at conferences, was that you want to have a way to abstract your your setup and teardown and have it fire before your test, but in your test still have access to the before annotation so that if you wanted to, you could create an instance of a page object and have it receive um, a driver object. So if you and you know the the first um, obvious abstraction would be if you have a test and it has a before and after annotation, you could you can create a a base utility class for your tests that then your test classes would inherit. And so then you would just move that before block into your your base test. But what happens is that before annotation in the base test fires, but kind of stomps on what's happening in the test. And so then you can't really create a page object and it ends up creating a either a race condition or just doesn't, a, I would call it a just doesn't work condition. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so then by using a JNet rule, um, it it kind of works around everything, where um, you can have a JUnit rule that that handles um, it's, it was the external resources JUnit rule, and it has a method that you can overload called before and a method you can overload called after, and what these do is these actually fire prior to the JUnit annotations for before and after, so you can end up basically creating a, an instance of Selenium in this base test um, class. And then in your test that inherits from the base test, you can end up getting uh, a- access to this before annotation and keep keep your basic, your setup method, and create an instance of a page object, receive the driver object that was created by this JUnit rule, and then everything just does the right thing. Awesome. Yeah, I, I never knew about it. I've been using Java for a while now in, I, in my framework, so uh, that was kind of cool to find out more about. And also, you mentioned base class. Uh, base object. I think most people are familiar with a, a page object, but what is a base a base page object for people that don't know? Yeah. So so when I talked about this, every time it was like I'd get a percentage of the room that would like scratch their head just <laughs> based on what just based on what I was calling it, and even the concept a little bit. But uh, I started to like add additional names. So it's like a base page object, a Selenium wrapper, a base utility class, a utility class, like just like get it like I, I, I don't know the best way to just describe it so that everyone knows what it is. When you say plaid, everyone knows, oh, plaid, right. you know, flannel, like it's like so basically it's the concept of taking the, the similar tenants that go into a page object. You know, it's like you would have your locators and the behavior of a page in an object and you do the same thing, but with your Selenium actions. So instead of having them, you know, all throughout all of your page objects, uh, you could take those Selenium actions that are common and put them into a class. And then the cool thing is, uh, is that there's a couple benefits. You you can start adding additional functionality in this one central place. Like um, if you have uh, a method that's checking to see if something is displayed on the page, and that thing isn't on the page, it's going to return an exception. So you can you can actually do a try catch to catch for a no such element exception, and have it return false instead. So the method will say is displayed, and if it's there, it'll say true, and then if it's not there, it'll say false as opposed to exception. And so by doing that, you you start to you know kind of 
bulletproof your Selenium usage a little bit, and then you update all your page objects so they're a bit more readable. And then if there were ever any API changes to Selenium, you just go to one place to change it. This is probably not super true of an issue for Selenium 3 coming at some point in the future. I don't know when because uh, of the <laughs> W3C specification. Um, but uh, it's not like as big of a change as when they jump from Selenium 1 to Selenium 2, right? We went from RC to WebDriver, and there was huge, huge changes. Um, but I got this this idea and this this uh, practice, um, I guess it's more of a pattern, from uh, Jason Labia at SeleniumConf in Boston back in, what was that, like 2013? 13, yep. And uh, he gave a closing keynote how at, talking about how at Google they use this pattern to migrate from uh, RC to WebDriver, and they they also did some stuff with web uh, webdriver back selenium uh, within this pattern but it made it super easy because the other thing i didn't mention is you could you could actually pretty easily swap out the underlying automation framework with this pattern too if you really wanted to like you could actually just say oh i'm going to plug in something else that you know that will drive the browser or uh, and, and you just back in the actions for that framework into these methods uh, that you create in the in the base class and then um you know, and that's pretty much that's pretty much it. Assuming they, of course, use locators right. <laughs> the same the same way. But yeah, I guess that's basically the gist of it. I was thinking in Ruby, it was like you could use Selenium WebDriver, or then you could use something like Mechanize, and then that would just traverse and, and use locators the same way. If you could find the commands to do the same things. Cool. And what I love about this concept, I don't know if you've heard of HP's new Lean FT. The reason why I'm mentioning it, it's a it's basically QTP, but it allows you to through an API and SDK, create tests in C-sharp or Java, pretty much like you do with Selenium, but allows you also to not only automate a browser, but also to automate the client applications. And like I said, I work for a big company and we have we actually have a web, a modern web application that integrates with thick client applications and you can't automate with Selenium. So if I, we use some sort of base object, maybe in those instances, we can just switch it over to the Lean FT uh, to handle it. But uh, just a thought, thinking out yeah. loud. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I guess the the big the big issue, the only real logistical hurdle I can foresee would be dealing with locators. And then, you know, in, in my book, I, I write about how you could create constants at the top of a page object to store the locators. And then the thing you could do differently would be just have, you know, capture those objects elsewhere. So then you can inject, uh, is this a web page? Use these web elements. If it's a desktop, use these desktop elements, that kind of thing. But But yeah, that sounds like a pretty cool setup. So, Dave, you also mentioned something about the Allure framework, and I, I, once again, I never heard of it. So, uh, what is the Allure framework? Yeah, um, so there's this company based out of Russia called Yandex, um, and they make they make some awesome stuff. That a lot of it's open source. And it's basically, I guess they they build really cool software products, and then they happen to learn a lot, and then they package it up and open source it. So, Yandex released what's called the Allure framework, which um, for those of you that don't know. It's it's basically a really awesome HTML report generator for Selenium tests, and it is platform agnostic. And there, there are bindings for most, like I think almost all, if not all by now, of the uh, prominent testing frameworks for all prominent programming languages that are out there. And uh, basically, what it does is you you plug it in uh, to your test setup and. Um, you just make it so you output uh, XML from your test runs, uh, just like you would do for continuous integration, into a directory. And then you also capture screenshots on failure, much like you would do for, for your test runs for any sort of framework. And then what you do after your tests run is you run this, uh, this binary that they have that will take those things and, um, and convert it to this standard schema that will then generate this uh, HTML report that is like a full blown Angular app. Uh, this just like really slick, like bells and whistles HTML5. It just looks really good. And they take the screenshots and they make this really nice um, interactive report. And um, and it's just like it solved a real problem for the Selenium space because most anyone that builds a framework realizes pretty quickly that they have to build their own HTML report generator if they want something better than just the standard kind of. Uh, gnarly looking, not super helpful one that that you can kind of generate 
with certain with certain test tools that exist and, and it just they did it really well and uh the fact that it works for everything is just kind of like mind-blowing uh mind-blowingly cool and so so i talked about that and that that's a really good one and then some people might be familiar with the index through uh they wrote this page object helper i think for people that use java they're familiar with the page factory which comes built into selenium um but yandex also created one called html elements which is is like a, an even simpler uh, sleeker page object um, wrapper, basically. Um, I don't use uh, I don't use it, but I, I've heard really good things about it. Awesome, yeah, those two cool things I, I definitely didn't know about, and I'm definitely going to check out. I'm using something called Serenity to get that reporting, but it also adds extra things on top of that, and uh, I guess there's pros and cons to that. Sometimes I don't know what 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 it's what's what it's doing in the background, so sometimes I'd rather just do a stripped down framework I created and just add in these extra things that do something specific like reporting rather than taking care of everything else behind the scenes. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. Cause you could, uh, you could script it out pretty easily and then you can have it just be, be sucked in as part of like a Jenkins test run for a job and as a, as a final action. And then you have like a really robust report. All right. Dave, I know we talked about uh, a few times we mentioned your book, the Selenium guidebook, but I, I've been hearing a lot of good things about it that you're working on some new things. Can you just tell us a little bit more what you're doing with the Selenium guidebook? Yeah, sure. So as I mentioned, I, I started in Ruby, then I wrote it in Java. In between those two things, I realized that just the book alone wasn't really enough as far as like making the, the material approachable. So I I added some additional tiers that people can purchase, like the cheat sheets, and then uh, you know two and a half hours of video walkthroughs. So very like designed to be as friendly for self-paced learning as possible. Earlier this year, released the Java edition, and then I just did an updated release recently, uh, a couple weeks ago, and and that was to update the Ruby edition so it's current with the current version of RSpec, and uh, and then updated the the Java edition to make some tweaks based on feedback I got from Java developers where they're like, you really shouldn't be using an interface like that. You should really be using a static class and like that kind of stuff. And then just general you know uh, bug fixes and that kind of thing, but. Um, the goal of the Selenium guidebook is is really, and also for my tip newsletter, Elemental Selenium, is to offer all of this content in every supported programming language for Selenium. And that's, I guess that's a, that's an exclusive for Test Talk uh, listeners. This yeah. <laughs> is the first place I think I've mentioned it this publicly. Awesome. Um, but but uh, the goal is to to branch out to cover every pro- every programming language. I get I get requests all the time for you know C sharp for Python for JavaScript, and and those are the other supported languages that um, that I don't have. At, that I think would be fantastic to offer to to my readers and to everyone that's not currently a reader. Um, and so basically the way I was thinking about doing that was different than what I've done in the past. Traditionally, I would just do like a, some sort of pre-order to, to gauge demand, uh, to make sure, you know, it's really something that's interesting to people, um, and then do it, then, then launch it. And instead of that, like that's like one book a year probably, and it's a horrible pace. So I'm going to do a Kickstarter to to basically put it all out there and say I'm going to do them all and and set like a reasonable goal for the Kickstarter campaign. And then, you know, assuming it's funded, then I'll do all of them. And uh and I'll do them, you know, it, it, hopefully before, you know, uh well the goal is early next year to launch the Kickstarter and then the hope would be like a few months after the Kickstarter ends I'd be able to to, you know, just rock through all of them and get them out there. It takes about somewhere between I haven't really done the math in a while, but it's like I'd say I spent about two weeks figuring out the code examples and probably another week before that figuring out like understanding this programming language. <laughs> and so <laughs> that I don't that I don't understand. Then there's like a, a peer review cycle where I get a bunch of people to code review. So and then I have to, you know, then I'll write the book, then I'll make the cheat sheets and I'll record the videos and then I'll repeat. And so that's probably like a six week to two month window. So I'd say probably six months after the Kickstarter is done to get everything out the door, which is like a tremendous feat to accomplish. I think yeah. considering I've only done one book a year <laughs> for the last two years. So, but I think it's, it'd be awesome. I think it'd be worth it. I think that it's, it's exactly what is like, it's, I've covered some of the, some of the, the need by covering Ruby and Java, but I, I think that there's still, you know, over half of the languages that are, that aren't covered. So this, I'm looking forward to doing that. Awesome. Yeah. I think it's a great resource. So if someone wants to learn more about the Selenium Guidebook, I'll have a link to it in the show notes, but is there a particular site you like people to go to to find out more info and keep up to date on where your progress is with that Kickstarter program? Uh, you know, right, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm at a loss considering I, I wasn't planning really to, 
to make uh, an official announcement yet, but uh, the easiest way, honestly, is to have to come to my either of my websites, which there's probably more than more than there should be, uh, and and basically uh, sign up for something of mine, and then you'll get an announcement when things happen to to go out for the Kickstarter. There will likely be kind of a lead up sequence going into it, um, just to to sh- tell people more about it. But um, the best places are you, you know, just want to receive weekly tips on on Selenium. Uh, go to elementalselenium.com. And if you're new to Selenium and, and you just want to figure out how to get started, you can go to elementalselenium.com slash bootcamp. And then that's an, uh, a sign up form to sign up for a free five day email course on how to use Selenium. And then uh, as far as my book goes, um, there's a free sample available. And you just find out all you want to know by going to seleniumguidebook.com. And uh, about halfway down on the page is the free sample. And if you sign up for you know any of those things, you ultimately end up getting the weekly tip emails from me. And that's pretty much it. And and so, I guess I'd like to uh, give a shout out just the fact that um, I actually recently got sponsors for those things as well. If that's all right. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so Sauce Labs has been, is, I know, is a sponsor of your show. Is is a sponsor of my newsletter. I'm really excited about that. Uh, I think they have a great product and. And uh, I hope they continue to have a great product. <laughs> so, Love sauce slaps. Yeah. And then uh, uh, I signed on with uh, Apple Tools as a sponsor recently. Nice. And uh, for, for those of you that don't know, automated visual testing. Or if you really don't like the word testing for automation, automated visual checking. <laughs> but basically, they are a SaaS app that makes automated visual testing easy and awesome. It's like, it's just as, as Sauce Labs makes it turnkey to get a infrastructure for Selenium. Apple Tools makes it so it's turnkey to use machine learning with computer vision to to like just do, you know, visual layout testing and, and a whole bunch of other things. Just, it's fascinating. It's like, I spent the last year basically um, researching uh, and writing about automated visual testing. And it's the, the one takeaway I have is the future is here. <laughs> and for a few lines of code, you could be in the future too. No, I totally agree. I love Apply Tools. I actually even love the owners of Apply Tools. Everyone I meet at Apply Tools is awesome. So I think that's a great recommendation. People should definitely check out visual validation testing. It, it actually picks up things that even our manual testers can't, can't find. It's, it's that good. So I, I, that's, I'll second that recommendation. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, so I'm pretty stoked about that. And um, yeah, yeah, those are the big things. Um, I'm I'm looking to offer more content around automated visual testing here soon. Um, and uh, I, m- I might incorporate something into my book about it. Thank you, Dave, for your Selenium Guidebook Automation Awesomeness. For links to everything of value that we talked about in this episode, head on over to testtalks.com forward slash 85. And while you're there, make sure to click on the Sign Up Now button under the exclusive Sponsors section to learn all about Sauce Lab's awesome products and services. And if this episode has helped you in any way, why not share it with a friend or coworker? And together, we can help spread automation awesomeness to the masses. So that's it for this episode of Test Talks. I'm Joe, and my mission is to help you succeed with automation awesomeness. As always, test everything and keep the good. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Test Talks podcast. Head on over to www.testtalks.com for full show notes, amazing blog articles, and other automation awesomeness.